Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Our guest tonight is Luigi Zoya, one of the, I might say that, uh, most famous Jungian, not only analysts, but authors as well. And he talks about paranoia and the collective fear. Luigi is a training analyst uh, at the Jung Institute in Zurich and former president of the IAP. He is the author of numerous papers and books. <clears throat> the most famous one, I think, is The Father, which received the uh, Gradiva Award, and uh, my favorite, uh, Ethics and Analysis, also uh, the Gradiva uh, Award. And his latest book is Paranoia, The Madness, that makes history. And I think uh, uh, when I read through your short intro, Luigi, uh, I guess uh, you came up with the idea of uh, that topic uh, in the aftermath of 9-11 and came up with the idea to link uh, paranoia with uh, two archetypal patterns Uh, which uh, is um, uh, one is finding the scapegoat and the other projecting the sh shadow onto uh, onto one, uh, onto them onto the others, and that was with 9-11 with the background. And when we look at what happened during the last year and the, during the pandemic, it's exactly this this uh, pattern, this uh, behavioral pattern, which we could uh, uh, observe with a lot of people and a lot of politicians. So I give it to you now, Luigi. Thank you, Bernard. And uh, I apologize for, uh, with everybody for having, uh, well, canceled uh, um, the first, uh, evening we had uh, set. Uh, and if I may start uh, at, uh, um, connecting myself with what you said, uh, yes, I of course agree. Uh, apart from the fact that uh, actually politicians were very often paranoid even before. So uh, <laughs> that uh, <laughs> is not so uh, new, yes. Uh, as far as my interest in the topic is concerned, uh, in uh, around the 2000, I lived uh, in the US uh, and actually uh, a bit north of uh, New York. And uh, <clears throat> on 9-11, uh, we were observing something uh, very peculiar. Uh, I mean, not the fact that uh, Uh, there were uh, paranoid terrorists. This was also already known, no news, but uh, that everybody somehow can become paranoid, even as uh, well analyzed or not so well, probably, <laughs> uh, analysts. Uh, because uh, um, paranoia, I think should be studied a bit more specifically than other uh, psychiatric syndromes because it has a very contagious uh, side, which is interesting, of course, uh, in uh, times of uh, uh, pandemics, uh, I mean, material uh, pandemics. Uh, it is psychologically contagious. And uh, uh, for this reason, I have put, uh, a subtitle to my book, uh, Paranoia, The Madness That Makes uh, History. 
with this communication. Uh, actually, we lived uh, uh, next to a very big reservoir. I think uh, it was the main reservoir of fresh water for New York. And uh, it was interesting to see how we can become uh, paranoid and even how uh, legends, uh, quotes, uh, uh, can start, uh, or rumors. Um, no news, of course, in the newspapers uh, or uh, radio television, but uh, a legend started circulating, don't drink because the terrorist will throw poison in the reservoir. And then after a while, the legend had started circulating in the neighborhood, uh, but changing a little bit. Uh, don't drink because the terrorist will throw LSD in the reservoir, which actually for us Jungian is even more interesting because it was uh, collectively symbolic. I mean, the, somehow the collective unconscious was at play, you know, we had not uh, taken LSD, but we were um, sort of uh, tending to hallucinate. So uh, from uh, that year, for 10 years, I tried to accumulate material and study paranoia in, in history and uh, in, in collective uh, situations. And actually this uh, brought me also to a reconsideration of uh, uh, what we call in very general terms, instincts. Uh, of course, uh, psychoanalysis starts somehow as a study of instinct, the sexual drive. Of course, I skip distinction between drive, instinct, and, uh, and so on. Um, and of course, we know that uh, uh, we are driven also by the uh, need of food. But we have watched the fact that uh, during the 20th century, we very often overfed ourselves, both uh, in terms of food and in terms of sexuality. So we started seeing also the other side of it. Something on the contrary, which we don't consider, um, <clears throat> is the fact that we also, like uh, our cat, our dog, uh, have a territorial instinct. And that, like the other instincts of the animal, of the human species, um, uh, was born, some, the paleoanthropologists say, some possibly around 30 years, 30,000 years ago. Uh, anyhow, the Cro Magnon. Uh, uh, Mensch is al was already what we are. Uh, the remains tell us practically as a skeleton is definitely. So we assume that also the instinct were more or less the same, the, the, the mating, the sexuality and the need for food. Uh, but in those times, we know that the humans were very, very few, very few, and they were nomadic. So the instinct, the territorial instinct was adequate to this uh, society of uh, hunters gatherers. And uh, let me of course, uh, uh, apologizing for being over synthetic, but uh, um, another specialist, uh, 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 partly paleoanthropologist, Professor Dunbar has uh, um, set what is called the Dunbar number. That is, uh, our instinct, uh, our brain uh, is apt to recognize up to approximately 150 uh, faces. Is it? Uh, because probably uh, those uh, nomadic people. Um, never really met more than that in their life. And actually historical reconstructions, quite astonishing, uh, tell us that still at the turn of the other century, end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, and even in Europe, 
uh, the majority of people were not urban people. And uh, this large majority of people, more than 90% of the population practically met approximately a couple of hundred of, of people in their life, not in a day. So our instinct of recognition uh, gets crazy now, every day practically, if uh, we live in a city, if we take the subway, we see thousands. And, and so our defense, uh, defensive instincts and our territorial instinct gets violated. We do not recognize, we are invaded by uh, foreigners, by strangers. Speaking of uh, evolutionary science, I have tried to ask uh, some friend, uh, professors of zoology, what would happen if we put, for instance, 100 uh, <clears throat> big apes in the same uh, subway wagon? And they say, well, it's impossible. They will get crazy. And uh, we do not get crazy because our instincts are civilized. Uh, no? Of course, we, we do not steal food if we see food in the street. We do not uh, jump uh, uh, upon an attractive person, even if we have a sexual drive. Uh, and so we do not attack all those foreigners, but we live in a, a sub-alarm condition, probably. And we can see it, for instance, in exceptional moments. For instance, if uh, uh, in a theater somebody starts uh, crying, no, there is a fire, fire, fire. And then what happens, I think in English is called from the Spanish stampede, like crazy animals. And, and we kill each other simply in order to get to the door or, or things like this. So uh, there is a certain, we, we become in a second enemies of the others we become very, very aggressive. Now, the United Nations told us uh, <clears throat> that uh, in the year 2007, uh, there has been the overtaking. Urban population in the world has overtaken the non-urban population. And the difference is growing enormously every year, actually in uh, Europe or North America, we don't see it uh, so much, but it's mostly in the so-called, unfortunately still so-called third world, that enormous masses of people uh, move to cities because cities mean opportunities, but op they mean opportunities, but they mean also difficulties and suspicion because uh, those people all at a sudden, particularly in a, a society like the African society uh, with the uh, neighborhood and uh, uh, simple ways of life becomes modernized. And uh, in every continent, uh, you start trying to connect to other people through, uh, smartphone and uh, uh, the social media. And the social media, for instance, sell themselves uh, telling us that we can have thousands of friends, which science tells us is a lie from the beginning on, because we, we, they are not they cannot be friends. We do not recognize them. No, they are numbers. They are figures in our computer or in our smartphone. So we live uh, quite artificially. I mean, the post-truth, what is now called post-truth, starts already with the first step into social media promise us an enormous amount of friends. Actually, uh, uh, being a man of the 20th century, 
uh, I remember I, I like very much uh, Claude Lévi-Strauss. And Claude Lévi-Strauss says in his studies about so-called primitive, uh, Société Primitive, that uh, uh, so-called primitive tribes uh, usually can reach up to 250 maximum, 200, 250 group of, of that amount, after which they split because they, what we call tribal or primitive uh, uh, cultures, uh, not, uh, um, they have no written recording and in order to have a minimum of rules and know each other, they have to separate. We have formed mega machines because they give us, we, I mean, uh, we uh, rapacious uh, Westerners, you know. And the first mega machine is possibly uh, the city, the society. Of course, uh, society, uh, city and bigger societies have been also bigger opportunities, but not uh, just uh, that. Uh, what uh, I wanted to stress is that they are also the source of uh, uh, continuous mistrust. <clears throat> and so, uh, again, if we uh, look at anthropology, uh, again, apologizing for oversimplifying, but it tells us that uh, I universal, almost a universal of very different culture, is to have some sort of uh, scapegoat ritual. Uh, so, for instance, a, a tribe uh, lives out of uh, fishing, and uh, one year there is not enough fishing, not enough fish. Our modern scientific Mentality tells us, uh, uh, well, uh, let's look at the water, it's probably poisoned or, or, or polluted, something like this. Magic mentality uh, of the tribal society uh, looks on the contrary for some sort of black magic. And they identify somebody in the tribe responsible for the black magic, and that person is. Uh, uh, sacrificed or maybe in less cruel times expelled and then uh, uh, in less cruel times uh, uh, the ritual takes place using an animal, typically of course a goat which is so similar uh, to the devil because it has horn, hooves and so on. Anyhow, some sort of uh, like this. Now what is interesting is that the, the explanation is false is magic, not scientific, but therapeutically, it's cathartic. So partly for a certain uh, time, it works. And we know that this being a universal, uh, in a very uh, synthetic way, and uh, uh, so following um, archetypal Jungian laws, can be reactivated uh, even in more modern times. And we know a person who reactivated something like this in the 20th century, and his name was Adolf Hitler. And the scapegoats were Jews, and then, of course, not only Jews, and, and so on. No? And partly in, a, in the chaotic situation of the mega inflation uh, <clears throat> and the, after the disastrous, uh, um, World War One. It <laughs> started the premises for the even more disastrous uh, World War Two because actually for a short while it uh, works. You know, the finding a, a scapegoat, which in Jungian term is uh, simply paranoid, an oversimplification, splitting and projection of evil. Mm -hmm. Now. Uh, not only is this is what psychiatry describes as a, a paranoid uh, uh, reasoning, paranoid uh, mental functioning, but uh, um, also we can say that uh, this 
paranoid functioning is a, the anti-psychology, the total lack of capacity of looking into oneself and seeing that we are all humans, that there's some evil, something wrong lives within each of us and should be understood, examined, controlled, and not simply uh, thrown outside and uh, uh, projected and uh, um, destroyed. So, paranoia is somehow the inbegriff, uh, the essence of uh, anti-psychology. And if you examine, as I try to do, uh, the career of Hitler, but also of Stalin, you see, of course, you cannot reduce uh, a historical phenomenon just to that, but that there is an enormous component, and precisely in that paranoia is contagious, they were able to activate that in the masses, and the masses were uh, rendering it to the leader, and so on. And of course, uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, those were extreme situations, but it happens also in mature uh, democracies, and uh, maybe uh, none of us is uh, old enough to remember Senator McCarthy, but uh, you find that in, in many books. And, 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 and the paranoid reasoning is that you will find that uh, paranoia is capable of uh, being always right. It turns upside down the causes uh, 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 and the consequences, uh, you know. And for instance, uh, McCarthy uh, was always asked, but uh, you, you see the the communist plot everywhere. Well, of course, it's a plot, it's a conspiracy, it's secret, and so on. And uh, uh, after uh, a while, the journalists were telling it, but finally, tell us something a little more concrete. And then he started turning things upside down and saying, precisely because the conspiracy is so big, it's all over. Maybe you even, you journalist, uh, you know, but people are part of that uh, conspiracy, then of course it's impossible to prove, you know, because uh, you uh, have agreed to, to keep silent uh, about this. Uh, so the ideology and the rationalization can ally itself uh, with this. Of course, uh, other mental illnesses, schizophrenia excludes you from society, but paranoia, on the contrary, can lend itself to a powerful leader and for a while be one of the tools of the success uh, of this uh, leader. I think I have heard some uh, politician in the U United States uh, proclaiming uh, even quite recently, that climate change had been invented by the Chinese to damage American manufacturing. Uh, I, 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 I would like to ask uh, the people who are in Texas under the snow, if they still believe in, in this, for instance. No? So anyhow, the point, uh, totally unlike other mental illnesses, is that it, uh, it can be used as a political tool and it can be amplified by the uh, communication and of course even more so by the mass communication. And actually if you study uh, the history of the media, you see that they become what we call mass media once they compress and shorten the message, you know, to sell uh, more simple newspapers, the so-called yellow press uh, in the English speaking countries, make shorter articles to sell uh, the newspapers to more simple people, you know. And so what I um, have hinted to the uh, 
political paranoia of uh, Hitler, Stalin, uh, dictators, uh, Mussolini was not paranoid. He was uh, rather psychopath. But anyhow, it's not our topic. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that I would call, and I think in my book I have called paranoia hard, hard paranoia. What we see more in general now and in the democratic systems is a sort of soft paranoia. Uh, which is uh, uh, not less dangerous because uh, you notice it less. I mean, it's uh, less uh, directly, openly criminal. Uh, but of course, uh, the media like uh, newspapers and then televisions amplify it. But then with uh, the new century, we have so many tools which are an enormous advantage, but also an enormous danger for the uh, pacific uh, uh, existence of uh, society. And of course, the first step is already in the 90s, just in general internet, because already in the 90s, uh, uh, you might remember, um, there are studies on the internet paradox. That is, internet is an extremely useful instrument. I remember, for instance, the, 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 the magic of uh, already having at the sudden the catalog of the major libraries of the world at disposal. You know, you don't have to take a plane and fly to London. Uh, it's there. Uh, uh, but then the quite quickly, precisely because our brain, our mind has limits. We forget uh, that we have limits. We are human, not gods. Of course, that's uh, one of the consequences of the go uh, God's death and uh, our interjection of uh, God. Um, the uh, feeling of becoming omnipotent almost and knowing everything but the studies on the internet paradox told us already more than 20 years ago the first ones that uh, uh, there is a, a how do I say a, a, a turning point a point of inflection you know after which instead of uh, 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 what is growing is not the knowledge, is the confusion, you know, after a certain uh, threshold, a certain shred. So uh, nowadays, uh, probably many of you are familiar with another uh, paradox. Uh, I don't uh, share with you the graphic because it's the most simple of all you will find millions of, okay, the Dunning-Kruger effect, uh, no, which simply tells us that uh, uh, our competence, instead of growing in a linear way, because we are, let us say in Jungian terms, inflated through so many instruments of uh, communication, particularly those very compressed, uh, are convinced of possessing a very high level of knowledge. So at the very low level of knowledge, there is a, a, a conviction of, of uh, uh, possessing knowledge. And then it decreases quite sharply and only later and slowly it restarts growing and for instance say Nobel prizes uh, will be on that last uh, uh, tail uh, restarting and growing so but uh, there is a lot of confusion in the more uh, usual average uh, uh, situation you know the uh, so uh, the um, Practically, what we call the Dunning-Kruger effect or paradox uh, uh, is another uh, symptom of our lack of patience, 
of our uh, inflation and uh, of the reduction of uh, our attention, you know, of, of the span of our concentration. I'm sure uh, many of uh, in the, the audience uh, have uh, uh, heard and, and read uh, about uh, that, you know. <clears throat> So, uh, for instance, what is interesting to, to uh, go towards uh, the, the end of my talk and, and connect uh, with the present situation of the pandemic, uh, I have asked myself, of course, I, uh, I have participated in many video uh, conferences, video talks about the pandemic, and uh, one possibly of the uh, quotes good uh, consequences of this uh, is that uh, we see a lot of real scientists, uh, even in, on Italian television, which is uh, known as a, a television service of not such a high quality. I mean, the uh, more competent people. So uh, the the some possibility of contrasting fake news has been brought as side effect by the by the pandemic you know but anyhow uh, to close of course one should remember after internet uh, that uh, so called uh, social uh, media are have been called also uh, the great radicalizers or radicalizers, I don't remember what is the expression exactly used in English, um, because they tend to compress the message. Once again, a hundred times more compressed than uh, the compression which had taken place at the end of the 19th uh, century with the invention of the mass uh, press, the mass newspaper, as opposed to the, say, quality paper. You know, extreme condensation of the message. And what is the simplest uh, way and most efficient of condensating, you know, Verdichtung in Freud's terms, a message? Is to do like this with our finger, to uh, find a scapegoat and, uh, you know, uh, say, oh, let's destroy uh, this uh, uh, bad uh, person or this bad group, everything will be better, which is once again the anti-psychology, because if we want to be psychological, we should uh, do like this uh, with uh, our um, finger. So, for instance, uh, uh, to uh, make reference to another, say, mental pandemic, uh, uh, collective fear of a few years ago uh, here in Europe, the fear of, uh, uh, I, I make a reference to Europe because in the US, unfortunately, there are now and then, there have always been mass shootings, you know, they were less usual uh, in Europe, and there's been uh, terrorism, for instance, uh, 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 Islamic fundamentalists have uh, provoked massacres in France and uh, in uh, Belgium and, and so on. But so, uh, because of my <laughs> uh, studies on paranoia, I have been uh, invited uh, a few times, uh, uh, when was it, three, four years ago, uh, in um, uh, television uh, roundtables to speak about the terrorist attacks and there were people saying in the public, oh, uh, since I have heard that there, uh, there is terrorism, that there are terrorist attacks, I don't go out anymore. I stay home. I have enough food, I stay home. And, uh, and then I would ask, uh, oh, yes, but uh, uh, did you, uh, you, I see that you are so interested in terrorism. D did you look at the European database for terrorism? And you know how many deaths we have uh, 
uh, in Italy as compared to France? And uh, the usual answer was no, because in France uh, they had, uh, yes, a few hundred, but in Italy, zero. And people were locking themselves at home. And then I would try, of course, to blackmail a little bit and say, oh, speaking about another European database, um, have you looked at the last uh, uh, results of the European Environmental Agency about um, the, the avoidable death, that is the death uh, because of the polluted air, which unfortunately is again in southern Poland and in northern Italy, the, the majority of deaths. And uh, they, people usually would say no, because we have 80 and something thousand avoidable deaths uh, because of the air pollution in Italy. And uh, so I said, uh, so you, you, you are right to, to, you know, to stay close home because there is a killer outside. But the killer, the point is that the killer, uh, who is the killer? The, the killer is that I use the car too much, that my heating is turned to high up uh, in spite of all the recommendation, you know, to pollute less and, and so on and so on. So um, I think uh, um, we have to discuss quite a bit uh, about uh, this because this brings us again back uh, to psychology. Uh, Self-criticism is what we need and there is never, never enough uh, self-criticism, uh, you know, and uh, unfortunately we will not, uh, we, I mean uh, you who are, <laughs> uh, who have such a good will as to um, listen to old people speaking about uh, <laughs> uh, paranoia in one evening and not uh, going out and doing other things which are or should be anyhow um, not possible uh, for quite a while nowadays. <clears throat> so uh, the, 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 the paradox sometimes, I, uh, I was looking at those uh, data about the pollution, you know, is that uh, true, there was a moment in which there was a possibility that through the lockdown, in particular in northern Italy, in the Po Plain, which is so polluted, not because we pollute more than others, but simply because uh, we have the, all the mountains. Uh, there is no wind telling you, you know, as uh, uh, Napoleon said, geography is destiny. You cannot change it, <laughs> you know. And so uh, not, uh, let's uh, look at things in the face. But uh, of course, we should all use much less the cars. And when, when everything was locked, there was such a reduction of pollution that you could almost compensate for a while uh, the amount of deaths due to the virus, the COVID, <laughs> with the <laughs> absence, <laughs> sudden absence of death due to the uh, air pollution. You know, so uh, I mean, uh, there are many ways of uh, looking at things, but I think uh, that my half an hour uh, has expired. And uh, uh, if you want to talk, I am more than willing to, to talk uh, further with you. And I Hope that my English, uh, in spite of being rusted, was uh, understandable. Thank you. Thank you, Luigi. Thank you very much. Uh, the we invite questions and please write them into the chat box until they are coming. Uh, I have a couple of my uh, of questions myself. Um, you, uh, uh, yes, you mentioned not in, in a hidden way, you mentioned Trump. Uh, and uh, are you saying that um, uh, being paranoid or uh, paranoia is closely linked to conspiracy theories? 
Uh, yes, it's quite linked to conspiracy theories. This is the you find in uh, uh, in uh, all uh, psychiatric uh, classical textbooks. It's an, mm. it's an old uh, story, and uh, of course, when, when my book uh, came out uh, in Italian, that was in 1911, was the last year of the Berlusconi government. Mm. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, you still remember this name. And uh, a fixed uh, uh, topic of uh, Mr. Berlusconi was that uh, Italian judges were conspiring against him. Oh. And uh, um, the um, interviewer, uh, this uh, uh, actually writer himself uh, and the conductor of one of the Survive, few surviving uh, um, TV uh, corners about books uh, uh, had promised me not to speak about uh, politics, but then he showed the speech uh, of Berlusconi speaking of the judges and he said, Look, see, not speak about uh, politics, uh, you know, but uh, just tell me what you believe. Uh, this man who is speaking about the conspiracy of the judges, you know, is he, conv this is a, always an interesting distinction. Is he convinced? Is he paranoid? Uh, and I think it's a mixed form. I think there is uh, something of both. Uh, you, of course, if you are powerful, you tend to, we, we all are paranoid. Let's say, come on, this is of course another topic and uh, the, the topic of the little finger. We all uh, have a, a spouse or children or close friends. And practically every day we can have a quarrel and say, oh, you are responsible, you did this and we did. There is a little corner of uh, paranoia in each of us. The point is, is that we do not kill our spies, no? and we try to think it over, and maybe next day we are back, or even we understand better uh, what the misunderstanding uh, was about. So there is paranoia is, once again, I see it as a Jungian, that is, uh, as an archetype, as a, the tendency to find a scapegoat. So within certain limits, you know, it's a, 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 the point is when all your explanations become paranoid, you know, and, and of course, in a politician, of course, there are more occasions to activate that paranoid corner. And the more powerful you are, the more you surround yourself only with friends and not with opponents. And that was, of course, extreme in Hitler or Stalin's. They eliminated uh, the, all the opponents and they were surrounded only by collaborators or co perpetrators or accomplices. Uh, depends okay. on, yeah. <laughs> so uh, it, it can be very, very, very mixed uh, in a politician, but the point is that politics and particularly powerful politics and particularly powerful politicians, even in democratic system, who uh, do not have critical collaborators. And when they start another sentence, I remember of Trump is uh, speaking about, of course, the border and the immigrants and speaking about Mexico, they don't send us their best. They mm -hmm. send us only the criminals. Uh, uh, now, of course, uh, the, those uh, uh, immigrants, usually they are poor, uh, they, they are simple people, and being illegal, they will have a tendency to commit more crime. But the point that there is no they who send. This is already the beginning of a conspiracy theory, you know, this way of expressing uh, this uh, they. Uh, there's a question from Paul. We have now quite a bit. Uh, he asked paranoia versus schizophrenia, uh, Deleuze and Guattari. 
Perhaps one, one way of escaping paranoia is to allow oneself to be more schizoid, more fragmentary, less self-controlled. Does that make sense in that context? Uh, I think it's uh, a bit dangerous. <laughs> yes. I think it's, uh, yeah, of course, uh, it, it always depends uh, on what you mean uh, with a bit. Uh, the problem of quantity is not uh, a, a way of escaping a substantial issue, is actually the, the core of uh, substantial uh, questions and uh, uh, a substantial uh, statement of uh, one of the greatest masters of psychoanalysis was the good enough mother. Mm. Mm. You know, it's always uh, so the good enough quantity of uh, scapegoating or the good enough quantity of uh, schizophrenia. Uh, it all depends uh, on how much and how good. There's a question from Fabrizio Petri. What link, if any, there is between paranoia and the incest taboo? Paranoia and incest taboo. Uh, I don't think, uh, uh, yeah, that should be anthropology, you know, the, the absolute uh, the taboo. Uh, I think we all have uh, an incest taboo. Uh, we, we have all accepted the as part of the civilization, uh, the incest taboo, so a, a certain amount of repression. Uh, uh, and this uh, does not make us uh, mentally so unbalanced. So I think it's a big question, but uh, I think in principle, uh, the incest taboo is some sort of ur repression, you know, but uh, uh, it has left our civilization work. Uh, Dennis Merrill asked, it seems that there's a certain amount of healthy paranoia we should have about being spied on by hackers and government surveillance. <laughs> it can be so inhibiting when thinking of doing online therapy with people in repressive countries. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, this is absolutely right. And in my book, uh, uh, I made uh, so many examples uh, or, or in which uh, you find out that uh, paranoia was right. That is the paranoid uh, fantasies were more right than the, uh, you know, it, it, you, yeah, to make another uh, a relatively short-term example, we all know uh, uh, the weapons of mass destruction. Mm. Weapon of mass destruction uh, and, uh, and the Bush theory and so on, because the Saddam, we must destroy Saddam because uh, he has weapons of mass destruction. And one um, who I think is uh, probably the best uh, cartoonist of all of the old world, uh, Paz uh, of uh, Argentina, uh, made a cartoon in Spanish, uh, uh, which was saying, uh, you know, showing Bush and uh, I don't know, some uh, secretary or um, some advisor. Uh, and, and Bush was saying, uh, uh, Saddam is cheating as he's cheating. He has weapons of mass destruction. And the authorities was taking notes, yes, they're saying, uh, yes, yes, uh, Mr. President, how do we know it? Oh, because we sold them, <laughs> those weapons to him, you know? And of course, everybody laughed because that was uh, a cartoon of Octavio Paz. But then more recently, I think, when was it uh, some uh, uh, seven or something? I, I, I don't remember. I read the whole inquiry on the New York Times, I think approximately seven years ago was that uh, the paranoid fantasies was right that actually <laughs> the US secretly sold 
weapons of mass destruction to Saddam when he was a good guy because he was making war to uh, a yeah. bad guy. <laughs> yeah. mm. So sometimes, I mean, the, you know, we are uh, really uh, at the border, uh, letting our paranoid fantasy go over like the cartoonist uh, did, uh, can be right. Mm. E. Fernandez asks, if I understand correctly, paranoia is related to the scapegoat ritual, and it is normal in all of us, so in your opinion. What would paranoia be compensating for? Compensating? Uh, well, uh, compensating uh, simply for our uh, lack of uh, uh, moral honesty. For, it's a compensation of our uh, moral incapacity, of uh, our uh, incapacity of uh, uh, controlling evil in ourselves. So, the so need to project it outside always. Yes. So, so, the more immoral you are in your heart, the more paranoid you are. Uh, yes, yes. The, the, in, this, in a simple way. It, it, then one can say the more right wing a party is, the more the more it instigates paranoia. Uh, well, uh, officially Stalin was uh, extreme uh, left wing, but uh, he was paranoid and he was uh, also corrupt and uh, immoral. Yes, but uh, it's uh, of course uh, it's uh, somehow the core instrument uh, of. Uh, the extreme right uh, uh, a bit uh, all over, yes. Yeah, you see it in America, or you saw it in America, and you saw it in Germany, for instance, with the right wing party. Yes. Um, yes, Zah McNerland asked, what happens to paranoia and the energy created by it once it has been catalyzed, thinking of Trump and his recent political loss? Uh, can you repeat? What happens to paranoia and the energy created by it once it has been catalyzed, thinking of Trump and his recent loss in the election? Uh, well, uh, what we saw, I think, the, uh, what was it, the 6th of uh, January, I mean, that's all the... He, uh, <laughs> uh, he resorted to more and more, uh, I mean, uh, 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 paranoid uh, uh, convictions. Yeah. It's as if some, I, I, of course, uh, that's a hypothesis, but uh, the feeling uh, we can get is that uh, he was getting really more paranoid and inciting this attack to the capital uh, became uh, uh, part of it, uh, you know. And, uh, uh, an image I, I have uh, used in my description of the paranoia is also the steeper slope. You know, the paranoia, uh, is, with paranoia, your mental balance is not on a, a normal plane, horizontal plane. Uh, it's, you are on an inclined slope. And very often you, uh, the uneasiness of some situation makes you move, but the more you move, you, the more you move, uh, you go to the steeper part of the uh, slope. And then in order to try to get out, you go more and more inside the paranoid, uh, uh, but that you, of course, you see it uh, uh, in, uh, once again, in very synthetic form in uh, uh, Hitler and Stalin, who um, uh, Stalin at the end, uh, uh, Stalin, sorry, at the uh, beginning of the uh, World War II with Nazi Germany, at the uh, uh, beginning of Operation Barbarossa, uh, was almost without high commands in yes. his troops. 
because uh, in order to regain trust for himself, he was eliminating more and more and more people who in his feeling were able to compete. And in Hitler, you see it towards the end, you know, of course, uh, after uh, July 20th, uh, the, the mm. uh, attack, uh, he practically eliminates uh, everybody and gives order. And uh, there is even uh, the um, um, Nero Befeil, yeah. you know, which is the self-destruction of, uh, of Germany. So there is a very uh, self-destructive hidden because you, if we do not recognize our imperfection and always project it on our side, in fact, in a manageable amount of paranoia, uh, gets more and more uh, transformed into a total delusion, uncontrollable. Um, uh, concerning that, Amir Din is asking, is it possible to talk about paranoia as an archetype or its associations or amplifications? Mm -hmm. Yes, what I have tried to do is that uh, is to use, say, an archetypal reasoning. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the, the scapegoat uh, is an archetype. And uh, yes, unlike uh, other uh, mental uh, syndromes, illnesses, it has a quite, for me, clear uh, uh, pattern which we can trace back to uh, a Jungian model. It's our fight with evil, in essence. If we are not conscious that uh, uh, each of us uh, has uh, the task to fight evil as a moral task, and first of all, of course, inside, then uh, we, we lose control of this uh, archetypal source. Therefore, the other uh, mental is something corresponding of course, it uh, can be searched, but it's not so evident. A little bit different, I think, uh, of my understanding, but Zafiru Zarifi asks, if I understand you well, and to use the language of neuroscience, we understand that paranoia is hardwired, but we discover, discover that empathy is also hardwired. What I mean is that in a situation of great fear, such as you mentioned, a fire in the theater, for instance, uh, some will be taken into the stampede and fully participate in it. Others will lend a hand to help others. Where does paranoia stand in this context? Well, first of all, is paranoia hardware? Uh, <laughs> uh, I think I, I am not competent enough to use in the correct, correct way uh, why. But, but uh, of course, uh, in the situation of fire, yes, the, those who run uh, and are responsible for the <coughs> stampede uh, are paranoid, and, and uh, the good people will lend a hand. And I am afraid uh, that uh, uh, numerically, uh, the majority will follow the animal instinct of the stampede. Uh, you need uh, uh, some goodwill and also some rationality, I think, to give a hand. That is, for instance, in the uh, case of the theater in fire, you have to uh, put yourself against the wall and, and uh, other details. And uh, it's not so automatic and uh, not so instinctive as it is uh, instinctive to run uh, in an animal way. So I am afraid uh, it's difficult to put them uh, on the uh, uh, same level actually, but uh, human beings uh, are more complicated and they have built uh, uh, theaters and they have built fire escapes and, and things like this theoretically. Uh, I'm, I'm not did quite sure. Build, did we build uh, enough fire escapes also psychologically? That's the point. I'm not quite sure if paranoia is actually hardwired. And it would be 
in, in, the, in the context of evolution, it would be an, an asset. Uh -huh. Paranoid. And what could yeah. that mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, go. We are nearing the end. A couple of more questions. Um, Nomi asks, would paranoia be compensating for naiv naiv naivete? Mm, no, but no, because paranoia is in itself extremely naive. Uh, I made, I mean, uh, some examples, <clears throat> McCarthy with a conspiracy or, or Hitler with a Jewish plot or whatever. But these were, I mean, people who were politically clever, but uh, uh, the majority uh, of paranoids and the majority of our uh, little daily paranoia is not so clever. Uh, I mean, when we we scapegoat uh, a friend or a spouse, we are simply too impatient, too aggressive. We do not express, of course, in our super compressed uh, and super post-civilized or post whatever, post everything society, uh, we do not, it's true, express also pacifist society, we do not express uh, our aggressivity. So if we are unconscious, we are more prone to paranoia. And unfortunately, uh, populism, uh, populism shows this. You find more paranoia among the more, the most simple people. Yes. Antonio Nanfranchi asks, could you comment about the relationship between paranoia and trauma, both on an individual and a collective level? Uh, I think, uh, uh, I think uh, if you can connect it, but not necessarily. Uh, uh, of course, uh, you can. Uh, I have worked a lot for instance, a whole uh, chapter of my book on the uh, Dolstos Legende, you know, the legend of the stab in the back. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, which was, uh, it's complicated because you can say, because that comes also, you know, from the, the prototypal hero in Germany, Siegfried. So how dies Siegfried, you know, with the stab in the back. And so you, you activate uh, the collective unconscious. But does that have to do also with the collective trauma of the uh, fact that, uh, of course, uh, uh, Germany still uh, in summer uh, fall 18 sounded to many invincible and actually it still occupied French territory. Mm -hmm. A lot of French territory in the West and an enormous amount of uh, uh, <laughs> Russian <laughs> uh, territory in the East. So the legend, the, the, the collective trauma and so on. But uh, uh, that was uh, used first, I think, by, I don't remember if uh, Hindenburg, I think, uh, in the commission inquiring on the causes of the defeat uh, and so on. And, and you can speak of the collective trauma and Hitler picked it up uh, and, but, uh, I doubt it's uh, a, because, of course, I have been particularly interested in this uh, horrifying aspect of the collective paranoia and the uh, scapegoating uh, <laughs> half of Europe and, or at least uh, millions of people. Uh, it's not possible to say whether. Uh, a crazy mind like uh, Hitler 
would have anyhow uh, used, uh, uh, expressed paranoia in his political theory uh, and uh, have found followers even without the collective uh, trauma of the, uh, the uh, by the way, the stab in the back, the expression came from an English general, so it's uh, <laughs> complicated. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and in individual cases, of course, uh, <laughs> it's a bit tricky because then in those seminars, uh, I am often asked, but uh, how do you discuss with the paranoid patient this? And the unavoidable answer is, look, uh, I am uh, discussing with you, Antonio, you know, with you, Bernard, and so on, because we are, let's say, if I may, ordinary people. So we have our ordinary bit uh, of paranoia in us. You know? we, we can be very angry at somebody and say, oh, I would like to kill it. But uh, um, uh, the, the, the real paranoid, person does not come into analysis. So I cannot say uh, in the individual case of paranoia to what extent it is connected to a trauma, because the real paranoia, I, I, I don't think that there is such a great connection. Mm. Okay, uh, it's 10 past 10. Uh, I think we leave it here. Uh, thank you very, very much, Luigi for your contribution, that uh, interesting discussion, and for being with us. A great honor, I must say. And one last thing to say is to announce the next Psychosocial Wednesday, if it's already next week, because Luigi's was a little bit postponed. And it's done with Chiara Giacardi, I hope it's pronounced correctly, and Mauro Magatti. Individuation as psychosocial generativity. So, thank you very much to everybody participating, and I hope to see you next week. Thank you, Luigi. I hope to see you too. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.